All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to STL History Live. The vote, what St. Louis men expected, what St. Louis women did. My name is Aaron Pelker. I'm a community engagement coordinator with the Missouri History Museum's Education and Visitor Experience Department. And I wanna thank you for spending part of your Thursday evening with us. Before we get to tonight's presentation, I do have a couple of brief remarks. First, I wanna mention that all three Missouri Historical Society locations are open to the public from Wednesday through Sunday. Your safety is a top priority and we'd love for you to visit if you feel comfortable. Advanced free reservations are required to visit all our locations, but please visit mohistory.org to plan your visit and reserve your free tickets. Next, I'd like to mention that tonight's program is presented in conjunction with the museum's exhibit, Beyond the Ballot, St. Louis and Suffrage, which is open to the public now through March of 2022. And I'd like to thank all of our museum members and the Zoo Museum Tax District for their generous support for both our exhibits and our programming. Lastly, before I turn it over to my collaborator on tonight's program, I do wanna explain a few of the features you'll find on Zoom that may be helpful this evening. First, I want to mention that this presentation will be about 30 minutes with 10 minutes at the end for audience Q&A. You can submit your questions for our speaker through the Q&A feature on your toolbar. We do ask that you wait until the end of the presentation before you submit those questions. At the conclusion of the program, we hope you'll complete a short survey that will open automatically in your internet browser. We appreciate and look forward to your feedback. With that, I'd like to turn it over to my collaborator on tonight's program, Rose Jansen, Director of Public Science Programs and Science Speakers at the Academy of Science St. Louis to introduce tonight's featured speaker. Thank you and enjoy. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, everybody. So as Aaron said, my name is Rose Jansen. I'm with the Academy of Science St. Louis and we're very pleased to be partnering with the Missouri History Museum to bring you tonight's Perspectives on Science and History Talk, The Vote, What St. Louis Men Expected, What St. Louis Women Did. For those of you who are not familiar with the Academy, I'm gonna take just a moment to tell you a little bit about who we are. We're an independent science organization. We're supported entirely through community contributions. And at venues throughout the region, we connect science in the community through free and or very low cost public talks, science seminars and workshops and trips and tours that feature scientists and engineering professionals of both national and international renown. In addition to advancing the public understanding of science, it's our mission to inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates, which we do by offering a full array of free and low cost opportunities expressly for teens, such as our teen science cafes, STEM Teens Youth Leadership Council, Junior Academy of Science, and the Regional Academy of Science, St. Louis Science Fair and Honors Division. You can find more information on the Junior Academy and all of our community-wide science events and programs by visiting our website at academyofsciencestl.org, or you may also visit us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can also sign up to receive Academy e-news on upcoming events uh, on our website, again, at academyofsciencestl.org. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Linda Harris Dobkins. Dr. Dobkins earned her PhD in economics. She has a love for economic history and is a native Missourian, but retired in Virginia from a small private school, Emory and Henry College in 2014. For years, she researched St. Louis as she traveled back home on breaks. That research resulted in a fiction mystery series set in St. Louis in 1910, featuring a young suffragist under Linda's pen name, Joe Allison. The last two articles Linda wrote during her academic career involved the political economy of women getting the vote in St. Louis. Linda is currently working on a survey of St. Louis history for Globe Pequot Press's Storied and Scandalous series. Storied and Scandalous St. Louis is due out a year from now in October 2021, so be on the lookout for that. And we are very pleased to have her here with us tonight to talk about the vote what St. Louis men expected, what St. Louis women did. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda harris Dawkins? Thank you. Let's see if I can get the right screen up. There we go. Okay. Um, I am delighted to talk to you tonight because in a way it's, it's a hundred year anniversary. 
hundred years ago tonight in St. Louis, there were a lot of anxious men. They had gambled on giving women the vote and with an election coming up in five days and lots of controversy swirling around it, they weren't very sure what would happen. And that may sound familiar, I realize. Some of you may have already voted in, in St. Louis, but um, anxiety over an election is something we can understand even a hundred years later. So what we wanna talk about tonight is a hundred years ago. And I should tell you right now, in case you're, you're wondering, the purple, gold, and white were the colors of suffrage. And so I'm using those. Uh, because I lived in Louisiana for a number of years, I, I look at this and I wanna throw some green in there and catch some Mardi Gras beads. These are also most of the colors of, um, of Mardi Gras. But nevertheless, this is a very St. Louis story. And what we're going to try to do is unravel this notion of getting the vote because it's not as simple as it seems, as you can imagine. Um, I started doing research, as Rose mentioned, for a series of novels that I wrote many years ago. And because I was interested in suffrage for my character's sake, I started looking through all of these documents, and, and there are a ton of them out there, from the Equal Suffrage League. And then I continued reading as it morphed into the League of Women Voters, and I found two really fascinating stories. Okay. One, from a very academic standpoint, is why men would share the vote. I mean, if you think about it, why would any group that's in power choose to share that power? Okay. And so I did a lot of thinking and a lot of reading about the situation in St. Louis and tried to figure out why men in Missouri would do that. Um, that's one good story. An even better story is what women did, because as I said, men had essentially gambled okay, that women would act the way they thought they should act. Okay, And coming up on you know the first election in 1920, it was not at all obvious that that was going to happen. So that's what we're going to, to go through here. Here's an order of what we're going to talk about. This notion of how the vote was gotten, and of course, as I just said, the vote was given more than gotten, but we're going to look at that in a little bit of detail. We're going to look at what men were thinking and how that changed to the point that they were willing to give women the vote. And then we're going to look at what women did with the vote. And this is where the story is so good. As I say, I started this because I was looking at fiction, but you've heard the, the old thing that the truth can be stranger than fiction. And, and I found such good stories that I, I believe that. And then we'll look at an assessment of, of the results of what happened to women in St. Louis. There are two ways basically that women could approach this. They could go to a small group of men in a general assembly or the US Congress okay, and hope that they could persuade just those men or they could go to all men, all men who voted at least, in a referendum. And early in the 19 teens, women in Missouri tried that. They tried it with the General Assembly, as you can see in 1913, 1915, 1917, and didn't get anywhere. But the referendum was even worse. A referendum to give women the vote went down like two to one across the state. However, by 1919, something had clearly changed. The Missouri General Assembly gave women the right to vote in presidential elections, and they did it before the US Congress got around to passing the 19th Amendment. Okay? Missouri had been considered a state that it was just highly, highly unlikely that suffrage would ever go anywhere in the Missouri Assembly. And it, it did. And so that's, that's the, the key point right in there between 1917 and 1919 that we need to, to look at. Okay? As a matter of fact, once Congress did later in 1919 approve the 19th Amendment, easy way to remember it, isn't it? Um, Missouri was one of a bunch of states who jumped in and almost immediately ratified it. Okay? So what happened? What were men thinking? Okay, there were a few men out there, and I mean a few, okay, 
who thought that women were men's equals and they were equal citizens and therefore they should have a vote. There were not very many of these men waiting down that side of the scale that indicates approval. Okay? There were more men who were willing to consider that maybe women had earned the vote. In the early 20th century, most of these men looked at gender relations as women's sphere of interest and men's sphere of interest. And while they admired what some women did, they always thought it was in that women's sphere. Here's an example. Charlotte Rumbold is one of the women featured in the exhibit, and she was a Central West End product, um, upper class. She literally wrote the book on housing conditions in St. Louis. She led the parks department as it blossomed into the sort of thing that we know today. And men referred to that as municipal housekeeping. Okay? Charlotte Rumble made an enormous difference in St. Louis in civic life. And yet it had to be couched in those terms. It had to be municipal housekeeping, not just a bright woman who's making a difference. Okay? But there were men who would have said, well, you know, someone like Charlotte Rumble now, she's earned the vote. At the other end of the economic scale, we had the hello girls. That's really what they were called. They were the telephone operators. Back in the day, St. Louis actually had two telephone exchanges. And those women, mostly lower middle class or, or even from poorer ranks, um, not the immigrants, but um, but women who are certainly not in Charlotte Rumble's economic class had gotten together and gone on strike. And not everyone had a telephone in the 19 teens, but the men in power did, and they learned firsthand the inconvenience of women who took matters into their own hands. So there are a group of men out there who will say, well, you know, people like Charlotte Rumble, people like the Hello Girls, maybe they've earned the vote. There were some other men who looked at that and said, you know, there's a lot of difference between a central West End crusader and girls from the river wards who have taken these jobs. Those women are not necessarily going to react the same way when it's their economic interests at stake. Okay? So then we get a group of men who say, you know, we think that women will not vote as a block that women will not do all these things that are being talked about. They're not going to get together and end wars. They're not going to, you know, prohibit drinking. They're not going to, you know, support pure milk or whatever these causes are that we, we associate with women, that women will follow their diverse economic interests. And more, the more men thought about that one, the more they became aware of a real possibility. And that was that our women would vote more than their women. Okay? And by our women, what we clearly mean here are the women who were associated with the men who at the moment held power. And these were the men who followed a vaguely progressive agenda um, in St. Louis. The power was clearly in the, the west side neighborhoods, as opposed to over against the river um, in the German neighborhoods or the even more recent immigrant neighborhoods. So this is where the gamble comes in. There were enough men in power in St. Louis and in the state legislature who decided that they could more reliably turn out the vote of their women and that the women who were associated with the lower economic classes were less likely to vote. And that, of course, gave them the possibility to help cement their power. But that was a gamble. I mean, maybe women would cooperate when they got the vote and maybe they wouldn't, but this was the gamble they were willing to take. And as you can see, when enough men decided that that was um, a gamble worth taking, then in 1919 suffrage passed and there you go women got the vote okay. now the question is 
what are women going to do with it? And of course, we've laid out the two options. They could vote as a block, or they could vote their individual interests. And it remains to be seen here what women are going to do. And this is why men were anxious 100 years ago on the Thursday night before the big election that coming Tuesday. The Equal Suffrage League was very active in St. Louis. Um, there were an, organ an organization of some sort, and they varied a little bit, in every ward. And there were 28 wards you know, spread from the river over to the Central West End. They, I mean, a wide variety of women were involved in the Equal Suffrage League, thousands of them in St. Louis, in all 28 wards. But when women got the vote, of course, the Equal Suffrage League was no longer an issue. And what took its place was, as you may well know, the League of Women Voters. After all, Carrie Chapman Cathead stood in St. Louis in 1919 at the Equal Suffrage Convention and said, we need to raise up a League of Women Voters. Lower case, because it's not clear that she knew exactly what that league would be like. Okay. So we have the League of Women Voters suddenly in operation, thousands of women across St. Louis. And I find this part of the story just fascinating. In early August of 1920, these women could not yet vote. They couldn't vote in the August primary. Later that month, Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment, and suddenly these women were empowered. And what did they do? They I mean, it's the end of August. The election is coming up in November. And they got busy, and they urged women, urged women to vote. Women all over town, you know, were, were excited about the vote. And we'll see the actual numbers, or our best guess at the numbers before the days of exit polling. We'll, we'll check those numbers out here in a minute. But these women went to the polls, and they had to talk about how you vote. And I think this sounds more complicated to us than it would have to them. But you didn't vote for somebody. You scratched the name of the people you didn't want to vote for. Okay, And so women had to be sort of educated on what to do when they got in the ballot box, all of these sort of things. And that would have been enough. That would have been a lot to do between the end of August and November 2nd, which was the election day that year. But they did more. This is where the story gets so good. They found time to come up with a cause. And it was a cause that it looked for a moment like all women would embrace. And it sounds absolutely deadly. Okay? This campaign was called Kill the K's. Okay? And the K's happened to be um, some judges who were part of what was called the courthouse ring. It was a little piece of leftover 19th century corruption run by a corrupt circuit court clerk um, involved judges fiddling with jury compositions, um, fiddling with sentences. The two big newspapers in the morning, the Globe Democrat and the afternoon, the Post Dispatch had been editorializing against the courthouse ring for some time and it hadn't done any good. But the women of St. Louis decide they're going to take on this problem and they decide to, and this is literally how they campaigned, we're going to kill the K's. Put out flyers, did all sorts of things, okay? The reason for the word K's here is because the three judges who were running, who were widely assumed to be part of the courthouse ring, all had a last name that started with K, as you can see from their names here. As this played out, and this is a cool story, the last guy on the list here, Judge William Killerin, okay, repented. I guess that's the best word I can come up with. He decided publicly that he would share the fact that he had been part of this organization, but that he would no longer do so, that he would, um, you know, distance himself from all of this. And as it turned out, he is the one man among the K's who didn't get killed, okay? He um, was very accepted, as a matter of fact. Years later, the, he, he stayed in office for a long time, and women in the league would say, wow, you know, we really appreciated him at the time. William Killerin 
stood up and would tell people for years, the league changed the way my life went, you know, that they made me a, a better person and a better judge. Great story. However, the two unrepentant judges didn't make it. Okay? They were voted out of office. And you can imagine the newspapers, particularly the Post-Dispatch, just went crazy with this. You know, they were saying, oh my gosh, you know, we have been trying to kill the courthouse ring for, for months and maybe years, and we haven't been able to do anything. And suddenly these women come in and in, you know, just over two months, mobilize the city and get rid of the courthouse ring. Wow, woman power. And at this point, you can imagine that there was some nervousness among the men that these women were voting as a block, but they weren't really. First sign of trouble here. Those judges were all Republicans. And there were women in St. Louis, active in the League of Women, women Voters, who couldn't quite handle the fact that the League had seemed to be partisan in politicking against these judges. So a few women broke away. We actually have some evidence because we have copies of the letters that the Republican party put out a, a form letter that these women could send in to the league officers saying, you can't do this. You can't go after a bunch of Republicans and not go after Democrats. And you, you can imagine all the things they said, but those women withdrew from the league. And I'm not sure that the league got the idea that year, but the next year, 1921, sounds like oh, a year to you know, draw a deep breath, but no, there was a school board election. And the school board in St. Louis had always been chosen to be half Republican and half Democrat. And the candidates were decided probably in a room filled with a lot of smoke. Um, but at any rate, a group and not the league, but another group decided that that was wrong and that there should be an opposing slate, okay? not one chosen by the two parties, but a nonpartisan school board slate. It wasn't the league's idea, but the league jumped in and supported it. And because of their past success, it became known as the league slate. Okay? But you can imagine there's some opposition here. The uh, pardon me, the nonpartisan slate didn't include, for example, anyone from the labor unions, which is, was a standard thing for probably the Democratic Party to include. There was a particularly vocal woman, and this was the first year, by the way, that women had run for the school board, a particularly vocal PTA rep who wrote nasty things back and forth in the papers to the league um, leadership. And then there was Mayor Keel, who clearly supported the existing system. That, by the way, is the same Keel that um, used to, have, the name used to be Keel Auditorium. You all remember that back before the days of corporate naming? Keel Auditorium on, on Market Street. Um, at any rate, what happened with this one? Four out of five of the nonpartisans were elected in place of the people that the parties supported, including the trade union rep went down to defeat, the very vocal PTA rep went down to defeat, Mayor Keel's people just fell by the wayside. Um, and in fact, all five of them would have been elected except one woman, and it, that's cool that a woman was even running, but she lost by 41 votes over the thousands of votes cast across the city in what turned out to be a very heavily publicized and contested election. By the way, one of the people who were elected was also a woman, the first woman to serve on the school board. But you can see where this story is going and you can imagine what's gonna happen here. The women who were Keel supporters rather angri angrily withdrew from the League of Women Voters. Um, and then women associated with the Central Trades, which is the organization of, of labor unions. And you know, I'd like to pause here a moment and say, it's easy to say that these women were just voting or withdrawing from this membership because their husbands told them to. But quite frankly, if your husband and possibly your father and everyone you know is employed through trade unions and that's where your livelihood lies, 
then that is a rational decision to make. To a, the, it was widely said that the League was open shop, okay? that it was opposed to labor unions. So that's a reasonable thing to do. And then there's our stray PTA woman down here. But nevertheless, okay, the League at this point, you would think would be getting somewhat worried because they're losing membership right and left. But the next year that comes up, 1922, okay, the League again goes into action. Um, a man named Senator James Reed, okay, notorious at the time, the most vocal opponent of women's suffrage um, on the floor of the U.S. Senate. In 1922, he was running for his third Senate term, and he was known for being particularly vocal about um, the fact that women shouldn't vote, and I don't think he ever got used to the idea. And the St. Louis women in the league decided to oppose him. You know, the other two fights you could have seen as nonpartisan. Maybe the courts should be nonpartisan, even if they weren't. Maybe the school board should be nonpartisan. But this is a clear partisan fight. Um, the women said that they were opposing him because he was opposed to the League of Nations. And for that matter, Woodrow Wilson, who was going out of office, hated this guy and was writing all sorts of letters to the editor in, in St. Louis saying, please don't run this man for office again, even if he is a Democrat. But most people in St. Louis said, yeah, he opposed suffrage, and now the league's going after him. Reed barely got the support of Missouri Democrats, but he did get their support, and he won. So the women sort of lost this battle. And you can imagine what happened. The women in the League that were Democrats broke away from the League of Women Voters. Even the women who voted with the Socialist Party broke away because while they might not have just loved James Reed, he was better than a Republican. So at any rate, they, by this time, the League with its thousands of people in 28 wards had shrunk to having organizations in six of the 28 wards. They had lost so much membership. And they got the idea. Um, I have not been able to find the actual letter from the national organization sent to somebody in St. Louis that said, stop this. <laughs> you, you cannot continue to fight these battles every year and lose membership every year. Uh, as it turns out, the um, another wonderful St. Louis woman who is, um, who shows up prominently, I'm sure, in the um, exhibit is Edna Gellhorn. And she was not only the leader of the St. Louis League, but she was a national officer. Probably someone wrote her a letter and said, Edna, you have got to stop this. And they did. Okay. The League of Women Voters retreated to what we expect them to do today. They ran their get out the vote campaigns, they did their educational programs in a nonpartisan way, just saying, here are the issues. Okay? And by mid, the mid part of that decade, the 1920s, someone had written a letter to them saying, so we've got another judicial problem. Are you people willing to take it on? And the letter back to that guy from the, um, the league president said, it is now the national policy that the League should not endorse or oppose local candidates. What that means, of course, is that women were no longer voting as a block. The block had fallen apart, okay? And it was not going to be actively taking a role in local politics as it had been before. So, did women do what men expected? The men who voted, remember, gambled that women would follow their diverse economic and political, and those are obviously closely tied together, diverse economic and political interests. And we have seen that that's what happened. Women with their newfound power, such as it was in party politics, were more active in the, in the parties. The parties sort of took them for granted, but nevertheless, that's what they were doing, or they were supporting um, labor unions or whatever. They were not voting as women, they were voting their diverse economic interests. So the men 
gambled right on that one. And what about this idea that our women will vote more than their women? Let's see how that one played out. These numbers that you see down here are the ratio of the number of votes cast in St. Louis in 1920 over the number who voted in 1916. If there had actually been a doubling of the vote, meaning that um, as many women joined as, as could, okay, these numbers would be two, okay? But nevertheless, what this first number represents, the 1.72, assuming that all the men who voted in 1916, and it was also a contentious election, voted in 1920, this says that there were 72% more voters in St. Louis in 1920. And think of that, a 72% turnout rate. I don't even think there's a projection that our current election is going to get a 72% turnout rate of eligible voters. Okay? So this is an astounding number okay, of women in St. Louis who went to the polls. Okay? But the question is, which women? And you see the two numbers down below in the district that include, included what we call the brewery wards. Okay. Um, over on the east side of town against the river. That number falls to 47%. 47% of those women turned out to vote in 1920. And in the central west end, look at that number. Isn't that amazing? 96% of the women who we assume could vote did. Maybe a few more men, but that number is so high, that has to be a huge outpouring of women voting. So did our women vote more than their women as far as the men in power were concerned? You betcha. Okay, That one was fulfilled as well. There's one other idea that comes up here, and this has to do with the League of Women Voters and their get out the vote campaigns. There may be men who sort of expanded their expectations who said, wow, look at the makeup of the League of Women Voters. It tends to be middle class and upper class women. And wouldn't it be wonderful if the only votes they got out were votes of women who were like them and therefore our women, okay? And there is a lot of words written about the League of Women Voters. And I don't know if you follow this sort of thing, but but in academic circles, in the feminist literature, there's a lot that says, you know, the League only gets out the vote of women who are like the League. And I don't think that's what happened in early St. Louis. We have lots of records about the women in the League going all over the city. There are records that say, here's how many doors we knocked on. Here's the result of our canvassing in terms of the number of people we contacted. They'd have these wonderful things called you auto vote, auto, A-U-T-O, you auto vote, okay? In which the women would go out and, you know, picture a, in an open top touring car of the 1920s and they would drive around every neighborhood in St. Louis and just talk to people, just say, come on out and vote, men and women, come on out and vote, okay? The other thing that we have in terms of a record, again, is Edna Gellhorn, who was particularly concerned about the participation of the black women's organizations within the league. Okay? And those women had dropped away as well from the Equal Suffrage League, but there was still a dedicated group of about three or 400 black women who met in, in different areas. And Gail Horn was very careful to make sure that the league did not meet in places where those women couldn't attend. It, it, you may think, oh, we were way past that in the 1920s, but we weren't. There were certain venues, particularly in the Central West End, where the league might be certainly expected to hold meetings and Gellhorn never let the league use any venue where the black women couldn't attend. So I think we really have a situation in which the St. Louis League, at least, was not just trying to turn out its own kind of women. 
it was trying to turn out all women. So I don't think this thing of our women will get the vote of, get out the vote of our women was really true okay, to the credit of the league and particularly um, the leadership of Edna Gilhorn. So what is, what is our reckoning here? This is a, a quote from one of my academic articles. What happened is that women acted like men in choosing their parties, their loyalties, and even their indifference. Women I know in the League of Voters just can't quite get their head around the fact that they're people who don't care whether they vote or not, both men and women. Okay? But it wasn't one gender or the other. That was true of, of both groups. Another academic strain that you'll see out there, and this particularly took hold during the 60s, during the second wave of, of feminism, you would get women saying, well, women got the vote in 1920, but they didn't do anything with it. What that really means is that women did not vote as a block, but women did do something. They did what was economically and politically reasonable for them to do. And beyond that, I think there's another important thing to talk about here. Women had gained a voice, not just with being municipal housekeepers, but they had gained a voice. It was a diverse voice, often saying different things, but women were heard in a different way after that 1920 election. Here's a quote from 1921. Um, this was the school board fight, you may remember, and during some support Mayor Keel thing, this guy, um, a retired Baptist minister, Dr. W. W. Boyd, okay, said this and it got quoted immediately in one of the smaller St. Louis papers. Actually, I, as Rose said, I'm, I'm working on a, a book that's a history of St. Louis and I keep coming across this Dr. W. W. Boyd. By this time, he must have been an older man, but I keep finding it on the wrong side of history and it's not surprising given what you can read here. He said, anyone who is acquainted with grammatical construction can see at a glance that the record never originated in the minds of women. Women haven't the brains for it. It was brought forth in the office of an independent newspaper, which was a slap at the Globe Democrat, as I recall. Okay. 1921, you could say that and get it published on the front page of a St. Louis newspaper. Here's another quote from 1929, after almost a decade of women's involvement and women having the vote to back that involvement up. Okay. This is a man who in, in and of himself is you know, Luther Smith, I, I don't have any other reference for him, but he worked for the Chamber of Commerce. He was a chamber officer and the chamber, the chamber, mind you, was doing a series of town meetings on civic needs. And he wrote a letter to the, the board of um, the league asking for their help, both in, in thinking about those civic needs and in turning out people to attend. And he said, no meetings on public affairs nowadays are complete unless the ladies are pretty well in the picture. That's a big change from 1921 to 1929 in terms of the voice that women had. So here we are, women have the vote, women have a voice, they don't all vote the same and it's not the same voices, but individual women have a voice. And I don't know what the polls will show. I mean, now that we do have exit polling, we can know these things, but I'm betting that five days from now, um, while we're all sitting around being somewhat anxious about both an outcome and what the polls will look like, just as people were 100 years ago, I bet that when we look at the result, St. Louis women will have had a voice that made a difference. And I think that's a cool thing. Um, this may go up somewhere. And so I've listed these two articles that um, have a lot more detail on both what the men expected and what the women did. Um, and there's my pen name, Joe Allison. And as I say, um, as I look back at those novels, I think, wow, you know, the actual lived experience was, um, was a good tale as well. So, and by the way, at the bottom of this, um, there is my 
contact information, my email address, in case anyone has questions about any of this and you want to talk to me about it. So I'm going to take this down and we'll go back to, I think Rose may know if we have some questions here. There's Rose. Hi. <laughs> Uh, we do have a question. So we have someone who is asking, uh, in your research, I'm sure you couldn't interview women that were alive, uh, but uh, maybe their descendants, uh, who were alive in there, but maybe their descendants. Were you able to interview ancestors? I work with a woman who is a descendant of Mayor Keel. Ah, oh, no, I, I bet I would love to talk to a descendant of Mayor Keel. Keel was obviously a a major figure, okay, and that's why Keel Auditorium. Um, but I, I have not. What I had access to were the wonderful files um, in the Western Historical Manuscript Collection out at Umsel, okay, and I could pour through those. And the cool thing about them is, is you see so many letters. I mean, it, it's really firsthand research. Because back in the day, that I mean, you know, there's there's no Facebook, <laughs> and and so you have letter after letter after letter, thick files, and so that's where I I picked up many of my impressions. But I would dearly love to talk to somebody who was a descendant of Mayor Keel. Um, that is the only question we have at the moment. Does anybody else have a question they'd like to type in the Q and A uh, toolbar? Nope, I think that's it. Okay. If that's it, I want to thank everyone so much for attending. I want to thank Dr. Linda Harris Stopkins. And uh, I want to just mention if I can share my screen rather quickly some upcoming, uh, you can see on that slide that we have our regularly scheduled STL History Live programs on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m., as well as our Soldiers Memorial Challenge, Challenge Chats on select Wednesdays at noon. You can see a couple of the upcoming programs on this slide, and you can find links for all of our upcoming programs at mohistory.org and on the Missouri History Museum Facebook page. So be sure to check out that lineup. And please don't forget to fill out the survey and let us know what you thought about our program today. So thanks everyone again for joining and we'll see you next time. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Linda.